for All that right. one. Clay Travis is the OutKick founder at Clay Travis on Twitter. He's with us on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. What's up, Clay? How are you? Doing well. How are y'all? Awesome. Thanks a lot. So Tennessee yesterday got a five-star quarterback commitment. Now they're going to have to hold him. It's not until 2023 this dude signs. Uh, but out of uh, out of out of the state of California, I was stunned, Clay, when I read who the last five-star quarterback Tennessee signed was. Do you know the answer to this? Uh, was it uh, Clawson? That's that's who Lance and I guessed. It was actually right after Clawson. Do you remember James Banks? And he ended up playing receiver. Oh yeah, 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 yeah that was yeah. him. I was stunned yeah. at that. I'd forgotten all about that. He was guy. a five-star. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was a big time out of Indianapolis, if I remember correctly. Uh, that there was a lot of uh, high level of expectation. You know, he ended up being a wide receiver yep. uh, more than he did a uh, more than he did a quarterback. But yeah, I remember that. Uh, I remember that well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, this kid. And look, I, I think it's difficult to forecast anybody when they're 17 years old at, at anything in life, much less uh, high level uh, quarterback play in college. But uh, what I've been told is this kid is as close to a sure thing as possible. He'll be a midterm enrollee, so they don't really have to hold him for that long. He'll get to uh, Knoxville in December. Uh, I heard the whole family is talking about moving to Nashville, so uh, this is a uh, you know family commitment uh, for him to be at uh, at Tennessee and uh, the family potentially moving to Nashville to be closer to him and uh, and uh, get set up there. So. Uh, I, I think Tennessee's going to have a top five recruiting class. Um, should be pretty good on the field this year with Hendon Hooker coming back, and uh, they got a pretty good quarterback already committed that they that they like, who's a freshman this year, uh, Taven Jackson, that they feel like is going to fit really well. And let's be honest, I mean, Josh Heupel has has basically shown that anybody uh, can uh, be successful in his offense. So it, it'll be uh, interesting to see if Tennessee can start to pick up some uh, some talent surrounding. Uh, Nico, and uh, also particularly on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, Clay, sticking with Tennessee, but going basketball, we've got a ridiculous bracket challenge here, and I had your volunteers playing for the national championship against Gonzaga, ultimately losing that game. But Tennessee was up six, eight and a half minutes to go in the second half. They were the better team, there's no doubt. Uh, Rick Barnes can obviously coach. What happens to him come NCAA tournament time, though? I don't know. Uh, I mean, that was a really tough one. I, I, it's one thing when your team loses and you feel like, hey, you know, they're close to where their ceiling could have been. Uh, but to your point, LT, I mean, I feel like Tennessee had a team that was good enough to certainly make the Final Four and contend for a national championship, particularly the way they were playing down the stretch. 15-1 and one in the SEC uh, really had been good all year, no bad losses. Um, and then, man, uh, to be up six with the ball, uh, basically at the uh, at the under eight timeout area and collapse from that point forward and end up losing uh, to uh, as you said an inferior team no discount to, to Michigan but in that final six minutes it felt like they had like four wide open threes and they clanked all of them finished two for eighteen from three for the game um, worst shooting performance on the season and that was it uh, and uh, and and to Rick Barnes I mean. You hate to blame a coach for any one individual game, but I, it's hard not to look at Rick Barnes' overall coaching tenure and say that uh, that I think I believe now he's two twelve and one in his last fifteen NCAA tournament games against the spread, uh, and that is uh, that's just tough to uh, you know kind of get your head head around to be quite honest. So um, I think the whole thing is a. Uh, Real disappointment. I mean, look, Tennessee's going to be fine uh, in terms of making the tournament, but whether they'll ever make a run, I think this is two teams that Rick Barnes has had that uh, that maybe three teams that are good enough to make a run to the Final Four. One of them went to the Sweet 16, and the other two lost as three seeds uh, in the uh, in the round of 32. That, that's pretty disappointing. Clay Travis with us on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. We, we are a society, Clay, that loves – to judge people on their worst moments and judge people on the singular moments that we see. And a lot of people have done that with John Howard, and he's given them plenty of ammunition. But we've seen the bad of John Howard, uh, John Howard. That moment after the game, though, with Kennedy Chandler, the Tennessee player, showed us a different side of John Howard that we don't always judge him on. I thought that was a really, really nice moment for a guy that's it's been through a lot this year. 
Yeah, look, uh, and, and I believe, based on what I've read, that Jawan Howard and Kennedy Chandler have a long-term relationship because Kennedy Chandler played on an AAU team or a travel ball team with one of Jawan Howard's sons. Uh, so that wasn't a totally out of nowhere uh, interaction between the two of them. Um, and Kennedy Chandler, I don't know what his, you know, pro potential is because there aren't very many, you know, six foot point guards in the NBA really anymore. I mean, I guess you can maybe point to Chris Paul as a guy who's had an incredible long term success in the in the NBA without being uh, particularly tall. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly how Kennedy Chandler projects. But I do know that if he stayed in college, uh, he would be one of the all-time great college point guards. We saw from him in his freshman year, uh, from the beginning of the year to uh, to the end of the year, was pretty incredible. Um, and uh, I, I think he's one of those players, and I'm not sure how exactly it's going to shake out, uh, that could be in a situation where, hey, could I make more money in NIL uh, at least for one more year if I'm not going to be a guaranteed first round pick. And I know it's hard to know whether you're going to be a guaranteed first round pick, but remember only guaranteed picks get a, uh, get a guaranteed contract in the NBA. So there's only what 30, uh, 30 guaranteed contracts every year in the NBA. And that drop off between being a first and second round pick is pretty significant. Uh, So I don't know what choice Kennedy Chandler is going to make, but I do wonder if there's a possibility of uh, NIL dollars, you know, potentially, making him a decent amount of money and allowing him to come back uh, just because of his size and where he might project uh, ne- on the next level. Founder of OutKick, Clay Travis, with us. I'm interested in your thoughts on Phil Mickelson, who's not going to play in the Masters for the first time since 1994 in the uh, aftermath of saying a lot of things, including calling the Saudis uh, scary people and talking about their human rights. What's what's his future now, Phil Mickelson, and what's his legacy? Will this taint his legacy at all? What do you see of Phil Mickelson? I, I don't really understand why this taints Phil Mickelson's legacy. I mean, if, if it taints Phil Mickelson's legacy, why doesn't it taint LeBron James's legacy and, uh, and any number of other pro athletes who have been silent about global affairs in an effort to maximize their overall earnings. Um, it seems to me that all Phil Mickelson did was say out loud what many athletes are not supposed to acknowledge, which is a lot of foreign partners of sports leagues have pretty awful records at times when it comes to human rights, particularly in comparison to the United States. And so, uh, you know, there's no Chinese uh, athletes who make a living ripping their country to the high heavens, right? There's no Colin Kaepernick of China. Um, And it seems that we have created a cottage industry of athletes who hold America to a standard that is much higher than they hold any of the international uh, partners that they have. And so I I think all Phil Mickelson said uh, was uh, what is true, which is sometimes in order to maximize your revenue, you have to uh, partner with people that have uh, skeletons in their closet uh, in a, in an incredibly negative way. Um, Sometimes almost literal skeletons in their closet. If you consider uh, what uh, happened with Saudi Arabia and the, uh, and the journalists that they, uh, that they killed. Uh, So um, again, I'm, I'm not claiming that, that, that everyone, that there are no uh, uh, sins in America's closet, so to speak. But I think in general, uh, we are far freer and far, uh, far more just than basically any country that is certainly a, akin to Saudi Arabia or China uh, or those of the of those ilk. Uh, but you know, to me, no athlete spoke out really hardly at all against the uh, the, the Winter Olympics being played in Beijing, uh, and and there were no consequences for any athlete that showed up there. Yet Phil Mickelson basically says what is uh, what is true. Uh, and uh, about maximizing revenue, and suddenly he's a uh, he's a persona non grata. I, I just don't get it. He said the quiet part out loud, uh, but what he's doing is no different than what many other athletes are doing. Uh, another controversial guy to Sean Watson. Boy, this shifted on a dime, and I don't know what to think, Clay. I mean, he gets a record-shattering $230 million five-year deal, but you still have 22 women out there that have accused him of sexual assault. Um, you know, I've always said, you know, if it's one, two or three, it's one thing when it's 22, that seems like a lot, but now it looks like the NFL doesn't view him as toxic for him to be able to get a $230 million deal. What do you read into this whole situation? 
Well, first, so long as your talents exceed your problems, and I've been saying this for years, you'll always be employed, uh, certainly in pro sports, but really anywhere. You know, the guy who uh, has issues and sells the most cars at a dealership can get away by far with more than the guy who doesn't. And, uh, and, and to me, uh, this is not only did the Browns decide to give him the largest guaranteed contract in the history of the NFL, by the way, they also – uh, backloaded it so that if he gets suspended, there's almost no punishment, right? There's almost zero uh, issues associated with that, which is pretty wild to even think about, right? Um, that, to me, is uh, the, the Browns kind of putting themselves out there. And who knows? I mean, there could be more girls. I mean, 22 is a is a massive number. It, it's hard for me to believe that 22 different women all made up the same accusation. Um, and, uh, and certainly he put himself into this position in some way by having this many different women give him massages. I mean, I think it's impossible to argue that these were athlete related massages. Talked to a bunch of athletes back when this story came out and they said, look, I mean, if you find somebody that you believe is really that great at therapeutic massages, then it's making you better able to perform at a high level as an athlete because uh, of the treatment that you're getting you're never going to move on from that person. And if you think about it, I mean, take it outside of the massaging area uh, angle. If somebody finds a personal trainer that they like uh, as an athlete, they, they don't just jump around from one personal trainer to another because you get better treatment and better work when someone knows what you're capable of and can put you through a regimen. So, I mean, this feels pretty clearly – uh, not something that was therapeutic, something that was sexual in nature. The fact that he was picking random girls off of Instagram and flying them in to give him massages uh, certainly is not something that would uh, that, that would make you believe that this was entirely innocent behavior by Deshaun Watson. All right, he is Clay Travis. You can follow him at Clay Travis on Twitter and visit Outkick.com. Clay, thank you for the time, man. Have a great week. Appreciate y'all. Thanks a lot. All right, man. Take care. Clay with us on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline.